Before I co-founded Twitch, do you know what my first company was? My friends and I were trying to build a Google Calendar before Google did. It was called Kika. How? By being part of Y Combinator's very first batch before they went on to be investors in Reddit, Dropbox, Airbnb, Instacart, and Coinbase. Here's the story of my shitty first startup. How's it going? I'm Justin, Justin Khan from Justin.tv. <laughs> What's up, YouTube? It's me, Justin Kahn, your favorite founder's favorite founder. You know the drill, smash subscribe and bang that bell and I'll be your best friend forever. Back in 2004, when I was a senior at Yale University, my friend Matt came to me with an idea. He wanted to start a startup. Back then, starting a company wasn't cool. This was before Facebook, Uber, and Airbnb. But my friend Matt was persistent. He's one of those people who loves to find things that are undervalued. This is the guy who once told me he loved Japanese candy, not just because it tasted good, but because it was underappreciated and underpriced for how good it was. Since we were college students with nothing to do, Matt thought we had low opportunity costs and free access to intellectual capital. He was convincing, and I agreed that we should start a company. The only problem was, what company were we gonna start? At the time, we had no skills and really no passion for any particular business. After a little research, we thought it would be good to start an internet company as we wouldn't need any capital for inventory or physical build out. This was good because we had literally no money. Gmail had just come out and we had all become early adopters and loved the ease of the product. It was so much better than existing web email clients that we were used to. Boom, the light bulb went off. Let's create a similar Outlook style calendar on the web to accompany Gmail. There was only one problem. Matt and I had no idea how to build a web app. So we recruited my friend Emmett, who was a CS major and started hacking. Little did we know that Emmett really didn't know much either. He was just one or two steps ahead of us. After a couple months, we finally built a serviceable demo. You could drag and drop appointments around. You could create new appointments without reloading a new web page. It was great if you wanted to use Justin Khan's calendar because it only worked for one user. We were proud enough of our demo that we sprung $250 to buy a short domain, Kiko.com. This represented a massive investment for us at the time. We'd also all gotten jobs lined up for the next year. Our plan was to work at these jobs and keep hacking on Kiko on the side. But one spring evening, our friend forwarded us an email from Paul Graham that changed our lives forever. Paul had previously founded an online store building company called ViaWeb and sold it to Yahoo in the first dot-com boom for a princely sum of $50 million. In collaboration with Jessica Livingston, Trevor Blackwell, and Robert Morris, Paul was starting a new program called the Summer Founders Program. The program was going to be run by their new firm, Y Combinator. YC was willing to fund startups as long as those founders were willing to move to Boston for the summer. This seemed like a great opportunity for us. We had an internet startup, desperately needed money, and were willing to live anywhere. We only learned about the program a day before the application deadline, so we had to scramble. We pulled an all-nighter in the Brantford Computer Lab, filling out the application and submitting it in the morning. The application form consisted of various questions. What we were building, how we might make money, what might go wrong, and how dedicated we were to building the company. We fired off our application and it was hurry up and wait. And then we got a response back. Paul Graham wrote us and said there were three kinds of companies. Ones with good founders that had good ideas, ones where the ideas didn't seem that good, and ones where the founders seemed good, but the ideas seemed bad. And we were in category three. So would we wanna to come to Boston and interview and possibly work on a new idea? Why not? We decided it was worth a shot and we headed off to Boston the next week. The night before the interview, Emmett and I shared a room at the La Quinta Inn in Somerville. We badly wanted to get one part of our demo running smoothly. We thought it would be a super cool feature of the calendar to have contextual event advertising. So let's say you, an avid Kiko user, had some free time on Friday evening. The program might show you a concert taking place that very night. To add it to your calendar, all you'd need to do is drag and drop it right there. Emmett and I were very early adherents of the now hollow tradition of Ivy League educated overachievers pouring their blood, sweat, and tears into better ways to sell you more shit online. When we got to the YC interview, I found it very, very intimidating. We badly miscalculated how long it would take to get from the La Quinta Inn in Somerville to the YC office in Cambridge and arrived with only five minutes to spare. The cab dropped us off in this residential neighborhood where we stood on the street wondering, are we in the right place? Luckily for us, Jessica Livingston came outside to usher us in. Jessica is well known as the emotionally intelligent side of YC. She did her best to put us at ease, but unfortunately her attempts did not work very well for me. And as we sat down in front of the panel of Robert, Trevor, and Paul, 
I was incredibly nervous. These guys had started a successful internet company and sold it. Well, I barely knew how to program. What was I doing here? I said almost nothing throughout the whole course of the interview. Mostly it consisted of Emmett engaging in arguments about tech with Paul and Trevor, specifically whether complex client-side web applications like Gmail would ever become widespread. Trevor was highly skeptical, but still the interview panel was quite impressed with our demo and which did demonstrate a somewhat usable Outlook style calendar for anyone who wanted to use Justin Khan's calendar. Thankfully, the panel did not ask whether it was possible to create accounts for other users yet. After the interview, Emmett and I wander around Cambridge for the next couple hours. We were in a bookstore in Harvard Square when all of a sudden he got a call on his cell phone. It was Paul Graham at YC. Paul offered us $12,000 for 4% of the company, valuing our company at $300,000. This was incredible. We were literally jumping for joy and immediately accepted. Someone thought our nascent company was worth more than zero. That was amazing. Six weeks later, immediately after graduating in June, we joined YC's first ever batch of startups. Emmett and I scrambled to change our post-graduation plans. Instead of going to the jobs we had lined up, I was gonna go be a consultant chained to a desk somewhere, and Emmett was going to Microsoft, we decided to return our signing bonuses and told them, we're not coming. The first YC cohort collected in Boston for three months during that summer in 2005. The YC office was in a renovated warehouse near Paul's home, which had bought and converted into residential space. Rumor had in the batch that the space had previously been a porn studio. Every Tuesday, Paul, who everyone called PG, hosted the founders for dinner. Paul would feed us this nutritious meal consisting of this chili glop over rice. It was tasty but not appetizing. We would socialize for a while and PG would encourage us to use the other founders in the batch as a test audience for our products. And then he'd bring in a speaker to tell us about entrepreneurship. Future batches of YC speakers received the pearls of wisdom from guys like Mark Benioff, Mark Zuckerberg, and Al Gore. Unfortunately though, as the first group, we mainly heard from friends of Paul, including his lawyer and investment banker. To be fair to Paul, he brought in a few great founders like Stephen Wolfram from Mathematica and Langley Steiner, the founder of TripAdvisor. Our batch was eight different startups, including the founders of Reddit. PG was very inspiring. He was a legendary entrepreneur who everyone in the batch looked up to. He was also very, very enthusiastic with the singular quality of being able to catalyze excitement for anything and everything new. It was impossible to walk away from a conversation with PG without feeling energized. Even if what you were doing was complete dog shit. Building a new email client, it's gonna be bigger than Gmail and here's 10 feature ideas that will help you get there. Building a link aggregator, it could be bigger than anything else on the internet. Every internet user is gonna start their day on this site. PG had made it, selling via web at the peak of the dot-com boom, ensuring he would never have to work again. According to him, the trade-off of startups was putting an entire career's worth of work into a two-year period and then capturing all of the gains immediately. For the successful founder, this meant having the rest of your life to do anything you wanted, and we all badly wanted to be PG. Emmett's and my experience at Y Combinator consisted mostly of PG and the other YC partners pressuring us to talk to customers and launch early. PG constantly asked founders, have you launched yet? When they looked abashedly at their feed and made a lame excuse for why they hadn't launched yet, he would exclaim, you should launch as soon as you can. I remember he told Steve Huffman of Reddit to launch, and Steve literally figured out how to launch that afternoon running Reddit on his development laptop. PG wanted us to launch, and I have to admit that getting out there and finding customer feedback is excellent advice for startups. Also, I suspect PG was motivated by a deep desire to feel that the hundreds of thousands of his own money that he invested in YC wasn't a total waste. Emin and I did not have a plan. All we had was the vague sense that we needed to build something that resembled a fully functional calendar software on the web. We would randomly pick features to work on and crank on them until they kind of sort of worked and then moved to the next one on the list. By the end of the summer, Kiko was a little more fleshed out than the demo we had presented at the interview, but remained completely unusable as a calendar. It was the double threat, extremely buggy, slow as shit. But we launched it anyways, and our launch was picked up by a new blog called TechCrunch. Potential users who checked out Kiko thought it was cool, but almost none of them started using it. PG told us this was the opportunity to present to a room full of investors. The room turned out to be about 15 people, most of whom were friends of PG that had been guilt-tripped into attending. My estimate is that at least 50% of them have worked for PG at ViaWeb, so he was directly responsible for making them rich. And they, in turn, probably felt like they owed it to him to squander some of those riches on his collection of charity projects. Kiko boasted hardly any users, and our presentation was complete trash. Emmett and I stood in the front of the room, mumbling and avoiding eye contact as we demoed our product. Nonetheless, incredibly, a couple investors showed interest in us. And by a couple, I literally mean two. The first was Alex Lewin, a handsome silver fox of a programmer who had worked for PG at ViaWeb and then Yahoo. After he quit Yahoo, he moved back to Boston and dabbled in everything from founding an environmentally responsible hedge fund to attending culinary school. Our second investor went by the name Princess Linda. She'd also overlapped with Alex and PG at Yahoo. Post Yahoo, she retired to Park City where she spent most of her time skiing. She was the first person I ever heard use the words plant-based diet. She also recommended that I quit using daily contact lenses and get LASIK to reduce plastic waste. 
Through some act of God, we had a couple investors interested in Kiko despite our presentation. I set up a meeting and prepared my pitch. After demo day, it turned out my mom was in Boston visiting me. When I told her I was going to meet some potential investors, she asked if she could come along. I was fairly nervous about the meeting and before I knew it, I agreed. Yes, I brought my mom to an investor meeting. Unbelievably, the meeting actually went well. Today, as an investor, I don't know what I would think if someone brought their mom to an investor meeting. I don't know if I would take it as a sign of incredible confidence, I'm so nervous I need my mommy to pitch for me, or a sign of extreme confidence. I'm so cool, I roll with my mom. In any case, Alex and my mom hit it off. And over a decade later, my mom still asked me to invite him to dinner whenever she's in town. They invested at the tune of $60,000 and Emmett and I were off to the races. At the time, this seemed like an incredible amount of money. It sustained our small company for about a year. All right, here's some lessons. Number one, you just have to get started. Our demo sucked, but we put ourselves out there and we got momentum to start our first company. Number two, be flexible. It would have been easy to say we're building Kiko and we don't want to build anything else. By saying we were willing to consider new ideas, we earned the right to work on Kiko. Next week, I'll tell you the story of how we almost sold four months later for a million dollars, didn't, and then got cloned by Google. Thanks for watching, guys. Smash subscribe, bang that bell, and I'll love you forever. It's not, it's not good. It's smoky in here, huh?